back to another video you guys i got my lacroix Ding! oh my goodness gracious me i have missed you youtube fam. oh my goodness it's been like two months i'm so sorry i haven't uploaded i've taken a huge break from youtube as you may or may not have noticed but we back baby we are back i've been on twitch if you didn't realize um go follow me on twitch if you haven't already we go live four times a week and it's really really cool over there because we can interact in real time and I and I can get to know you better you know what I mean I feel like YouTube is very one way but I'm happy that you are here today with me I'm so excited to get back into it you guys I can never get enough of the USA if you don't know me already my name is Courtney I'm pretty much like a self-proclaimed number one fan of the USA so in today's oh guys I'm so excited but in today's video we're checking out could the US citizens fight off the US military now this is going to be very very interesting of course in the United States you essentially have a right to a gun right something like that it, it differs state to state if you want to explain more down in the comments feel free I'm from New Zealand so I'm sure you guys saw in the news that it's not common to have guns you're allowed to but it's not common Leave a comment down below if you feel like it, and let's get into it. The United States has, without a doubt, the most heavily armed population in the world, with firearms being a part of daily life Literally. for many Americans. While in many nations, the mere sight of a gun is an extremely rare occurrence. In the US, some studies say- Pause it there. That is so true. I feel like I've never, no, the only time I saw a gun was in the USA, a handgun. I'd never seen a gun ever before. I've seen a BB gun, but never a real gun, so. And where I did see the gun was in the USA. So there we go, let's keep going. Studies say there are almost as many guns as there are people, while like, others say there are more. What is no- It's like sheep in New Zealand. With 3% of gun owners owning half of all guns in the United States. Oh my With gosh. this much firepower available to the citizens of America, does it really stand at <laughs> its own military? The US military needs no introduction. It has the world's largest budget, more than the next seven competitors who are in order, China, Saudi Arabia, Russia, United Kingdom, India, France, and Japan. Of $1.6 trillion spent on military budgets around the world, the United States accounted for 37% of the world total. All that spending goes to support the largest military presence on Earth. Pause it there. You know what? Thank goodness that we do have the USA spread across the world, right? I think it's a very, very good thing and we should be very grateful that USA is all over the world because they have such a powerful military. They can, they can help us, you know what I mean? Am I just being a simp? I don't know. I am a simp, but that's how I feel. I, 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 I have great comfort in knowing that the USA is right across the world like this because of their military is so powerful and obviously I'm a New Zealander so I'm an ally. We are allies. So let me know what you think on that. Let's keep going. List wars that rocked continental Europe for centuries. US forces are therefore pre-staged in potential conflict zones, where in conjunction with local allies, their presence alone is a deterrence to violence. The results are hard to argue with, seeing as Afghanistan. As soon as they left. U.S. military has proven time and again it dominates the modern battlefield. It has historically had the exact same troubles that every other military has when it comes to fighting low-intensity counterinsurgency wars. When denied the use of its overwhelming firepower and technological advantages, the U.S. military is in the same boat as any other nations and must rely on low-tech, door-to-door action against insurgent forces who don't use heavy equipment and don't wear uniforms. For all its military might, even the American military has great difficulties in fighting an insurgent Insurgency war. Should the American people ever rise up against their own government? Pause it here. I just had to pause it right here. So this video was from 2019. This image right here, you guys, if I I can't be the only one. This reminds me of the Capitol attack that happened this year, right? That's actually really scary that this image looks exactly like what happened. Like 
I would have thought that this was from afterwards. You know what I mean? That's so scary, ma'am. Anyways, let's continue. And that government authorized the use of military force against its citizenry. Mm. The American insurgents will find themselves in an initially favorable position against the American military. For starters, U.S. forces are widely dispersed around the world, meaning that unlike most nations, yeah, the least number of American in. combat troops and equipment is present at home as compared to overseas. For the first few weeks of the war, the insurgents will be able to carry out large-scale operations that will become impossible once more and more military equipment returns home. With the largest air and naval transport fleet in the world, this initial tactical disadvantage the military will find itself in will quickly be reversed. American insurgents could think themselves safe from major retaliation, seeing as no country ever truly wants to destroy its own infrastructure just to defeat an insurgency, totally. let alone the world's richest nation whose cities, highways, railways, and ports are all vital arteries of global trade. Yet one of the US military's yeah. major tactical advantages against foreign adversaries will prove just as deadly effective against an insurgency. Smart weapons were first developed to take out pieces of Soviet hardware from afar with pinpoint accuracy. The ability to to strike a Whoa. specific target from hundreds of miles away was a major technological That's crazy, offset. Yeah. American surveillance assets are also amongst the best in the world. Having a nearly 20-year insurgency war under its belt, the American military has finely tuned itself for counterinsurgent operations and is today the leading counterinsurgency force in the world. Not only has it developed a slew of surveillance technologies to better locate and disrupt insurgent operations hiding amidst a civilian population, but more important, its troops are highly trained in conducting urban warfare ops and the traditional fight for the hearts and minds. When the Soviets rolled into Afghanistan in the 80s, it did so as the world's biggest military juggernaut and crushed all stand-up opposition. However, within weeks, the war shifted from a conventional one to a counterinsurgency and war of attrition. The Soviets responded much in the Soviet way. Overwhelming firepower delivered very indiscriminately, and soon Soviet forces found themselves unable to operate outside of heavily fortified positions. Any Soviet foray into the countryside mm. would have to be conducted with large amounts of manpower and heavy fire support, and often it simply wasn't worth it. The Americans, death, right? on the other hand, initially did much as the Soviets, wiping out major military opposition within a matter of weeks with overwhelming firepower. However, it was here that they showed a better aptitude for fighting an asymmetrical war against a non-conventional foe. Wherever American firepower went, it was followed by major civil relief programs. Yet all the expertise, technology, and troop experience gained from the insurgencies in Iraq and Afghanistan would come into play against the U.S. insurgents. And this time, the U.S. military will fight itself with major advantages it lacked in the Middle East. For starters, it has home field advantage, and its forces are no longer mm. operating within a culture they don't understand very well. Cultural misunderstandings will be impossible, and by understanding the American culture, the US military can better win the fight for hearts and minds, turning many would-be insurgents from their path and garnering the support of civilians who would have instead supported the insurgents. Propaganda. Secondly, it'll be fighting to unite a nation which actually wants to be united and has a national identity, making the process of re-establishing a stable political system far easier than it was in the Middle East. Mm, Iraq so had huge sectarian divisions that plagued the country for decades and were barely kept in check by the authoritarian strongman. Afghanistan was itself also held together only by the very violent Taliban, who regularly used military power to enforce its grip over the people. Without these authoritarian figures forcibly uniting the nations together, Iraq and Afghanistan now, hey. quickly fell to pieces that were very difficult to put back together. Afghanistan would prove especially difficult, as its people simply lacked the desire for national unity that nations in the West have had for centuries. Americans, however, have a very strong sense of national unity and lack the sectarian differences and ideological conflicts <laughs> that would see the, the nation back. split up into Firearms. a conglomerate of cabals in the case of national government collapse. Sure, Democrats and Republicans may often be at each other's throats, but ultimately, as national tragedy after national tragedy has shown, the American people stand united. As the old adage goes, you're allowed to fight with family and call them names, but if anyone else tries to hurt your family, then you better watch out. I love that. This sense of unity will make the job of counterinsurgency far so easier on American forces than it was in the Middle East, and make it far more difficult for American insurgents to exploit a mistrust of the U.S. military.
Yet, while American insurgents are outgunned by the American military, they can take advantage of asymmetrical tactics to all but nullify the US military's overwhelming firepower. By following the same playbook as the Iraq and Afghanistan insurgencies, American insurgents could force US troops into close quarters battles where they couldn't bring fire support, such as airstrikes or artillery bombardments against them. American insurgents would also be able to enjoy the advantage of fighting a near-total urban warfare campaign, given the size and scope of US cities. As the first part of the 21st century has proven, urban warfare is the great equalizer between military powers, as it denies most of the technological advantages of a nation's military. Fighting instead is door-to-door -door and house-to-house, -house, carried out by individual squads of soldiers and little more than rifles and gadgets they can carry on their person. With the US military numbering at just over 1 million, and with potentially millions of American insurgent forces, victory for the US military will be all but impossible. A fight between the US military and US citizens would be a dragged out affair that would likely last as long as the overseas Imagine. insurgencies. It would be less a war of weapons and more Imagine. a war of words, with both sides trying to sway the majority of the population to its side. It's likely that in such a war entire cities would go rogue, with local city governments refusing to outright support the US military or the insurgents, and simply wishing to be left out of the fighting. They would deny the military the right to operate in its streets, but also not wish to support an insurgency which will bring military action against it. Despite the huge glut of guns available to American citizens, the truth is that there'd be no major resupply effort courtesy of an outside power. In the Middle East, Afghani and Iraqi insurgents were kept well supplied by Iran, Russia, China, and Pakistan, amongst other actors, and trade routes into war zones often went through Pakistan who refused to allow US forces to operate inside its borders and shut them down. In an American insurgency, however, there would be no neighboring power to supply the American insurgents, and the major trade routes into the US through which arms supplied by a foreign power could enter would all be very easily monitored and shut down by the US military. Within a year or two of heavy fighting, the American insurgency would find itself very low on ammo and very low on usable equipment. Yet the war would take a huge toll on the American economy as well, which would in turn directly affect the budget of the US military. With major parts of the economy disrupted by fighting or sabotage, the US military budget sure. would rapidly shrink, and it would no longer sure. be able to afford to operate its vast fleets of modern I equipment. Think about that in the end, a war of attrition would settle in and a winner is all but impossible to declare. It would come down to a sheer matter of will and which side would be willing to sacrifice the most to come out the ultimate victor. Yet as each side became more desperate, their actions would lose the support of the population they'd rely on, and thus lose the war for the hearts and minds. Who do you think would actually win a war between the US military and its citizens? Why or why not? Let us So the question is who do you think would actually win a war between the US military and its citizens? I don't know, it depends on the situation, right? It depends how bad the citizens want it. I think it all comes down to that and how many people you can get onto the citizen side fighting for whatever they're fighting for, you know what I mean? What do you guys think? There's a few comments here. This person said, as a US combat vet, I'll stand against anyone attacking a United States citizen, especially a soldier working for a politician. So again, we've seen some of that similar things um, earlier this year, right? So very, very interesting actually that this video has come up now. Um, so another person said, as a Marine, I can 100% tell you that a large majority of the US military would have no interest in turning against their own people, but instead joining them. As another comment said, we take our oath to the constitution, not politicians. So there we go. So I guess it all just depends on the situation, I think. You miss the fact that a large percentage of the US military would refuse to fight against the people who would rise up against the government. The great thing about the US military is that it's a fully volunteer military. Those volunteers would have to choose a side and not all of them would side with the government. This is regardless of who's in the White House. Interesting. I was under the impression that they had to take orders full stop, but I guess not. Let me know if you guys know more about that. Um, as a retired Marine, I would lay down my arms before battling a fellow countryman. As a civilian, I will fight to the death against the political army. Very, very interesting. As a veteran, I'll say this, no veteran I'm aware of would turn on his countrymen to help the government. That's actually beautiful to hear, in a way, you know what I mean? It's all about the people, it's all about the people. I believe an important factor that isn't mentioned in this video is the effect of the soldiers not being willing to fire on their friends and family. 
So, so, so true. Right, so it is, yeah. I was a Marine and believe me, we know we take our oath to the constitution and not to politicians. Imagine America trying to draft citizens in a war against citizens. This video forgets that people in the military are American citizens. Fantastic points going on in this video, in this comment section of this video. I'm going to link the video down below. So if you want to check out the um, comments on here, um, really, really interesting stuff, really insightful, especially for me as an outsider, as a foreigner, baby. Um, yeah, just really interesting that I kind of stumbled across this video that's actually from 2019. And again, as we saw earlier this year, we kind of got a glimpse of that. Just the glimpse, just a little glimpse. This video, sorry about the sirens. Oh my gosh. I live in the central city, so we have sirens going past all the time. We'll wait, we'll wait, we'll wait. Okay, you can still kind of hear it, but anyways. Um, yeah, let me know what you guys thought about this video. I'm so glad to be back on YouTube, you guys. It's gonna be a good December, baby. Whoop, whoop. Best month of the year, my birthday, Christmas, all that. Oh my, what is going on? It's a disaster outside, you guys. So stay tuned, we've got a jam-packed December full of videos, you guys, which I'm very excited for. And definitely feel free to head over to Twitch. We do live streams four times a week. It's really, really fun, really, really cool and positive community over there. So if you wanna join and watch and hang out, just click the link down below to my Twitch. Um, if you don't have a Twitch already, it's pretty much just live streaming. Um, super, super easy to sign up, free, all that. So feel free, um, it's really fun. It's really fun so guys thank you so much for watching today i'm so happy to be back on youtube baby i hope everyone has been doing well over the last couple of months and i will see you all in my next video bye guys